uh, to Harmony Baptist Church. Your faithfulness to God. Let's uh, just go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we want to come before you this, this morning just thanking you that we can be here. Thanking you that in this country at this time that we have the freedom to worship. The freedom to come to you. And help us never to take that for granted. To be thankful that we have a country where we can do that. Where we don't have to worry. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in and through our church members as we care for one another, and not only for the members of our church, Lord, but as you give us opportunity to look for and care for those who are in need, wherever we might find them. I ask, Lord, that you uh, just show us where we can uh, be a part of service to others. Help us not only to love you, but to love those, our neighbors. We do want to lift up to you as well, Lord, in prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. The Darden family, as they uh, go through this and cope, many of us understand and know uh, what they're going through. And so we just ask your touch of comfort and peace. We also, Lord, want to lift up to you those in our midst who are dealing with sickness. We're glad that Miss Elaine Pinner is home from the hospital. We just pray that you'll continue to bless her, be with uh, Jimmy Marlowe and his uh, family. I think of also of uh, Jimmy Sawyer and his family, too, Lord, that you will uh, show just how much you can. And there are others. Each of us knows folks that need a touch from you. By the way, this day, this time, even now, be a time of worship, a time of praise, a time of thanksgiving, a time to know that we are in your presence even now as your children. For we have gathered in your name and your promises that you will be there when we do so. I mean, you're here anyway, Lord, but there's a sense that you are present when your children gather, and so we know you're here with us now. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love. And dear Father, bless our time together. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. We sang this song uh, that we're about to sing now not long ago at uh, Thanksgiving, in fact. Count your blessings. As we start into a new year, undoubtedly we're going to ask God to bless us in the new year. And uh, before we do that, we ought to thank Him for what He did for us in this past year. So would you stand, turn to number 786, and let's sing... Count your blessing. We'll sing one, two, chorus, three, four, chorus. 786. When upon life's pillows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has. Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count 
your many blessings, but he cannot buy your reward in heaven or your hold on high. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. receive the uh, first offering of the new year this morning. The plates are here in front and over by the door. Good to see Tim and Darlene back. I think they had a uh, vacation in Florida maybe. Brother Tim, would you ask the blessing on the offering? Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning and recognize you, Lord, as the only living God, creator of all. Father, we praise you for that. Father, we ask that you bless us in the year to come. We thank you for the blessings of the year past. Father, we ask that you comfort our family, comfort the families mentioned here today that are grieving, the ones that are dealing with sickness and illness. Father, we just ask that you continue to bless us. We ask that you bless us all. We seek your wisdom. Take it from what we have Amen. 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 You may be seated. I think this next song is appropriate as we enter this new year. Savior like a shepherd lead us, number 688. Shepherd <laughs> Much we need thy tender care. Hey, you were going to start again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me for fouling those words. <laughs> Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, thine we are. We are thine, do Thou befriend us, be the garden of our way. and defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. to receive us poor and sinful though we be thou hast mercy to relieve us grace to cleanse and power to free blessed Jesus blessed Jesus hurry and let us turn to thee blessed Jesus Blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, Thou hast 
to praise him right now for the 78 plus years that I've lived here on earth. Um, I've had less pain and trouble than an awful lot of people, live comfortably, have a good family, and all of us, if you stop to think about it, we live better than royalty, the richest people in the, on earth prior to 150 years ago. They didn't have air conditioning, hot and cold running water, and all the conveniences that electricity and electronics can bring to us. And we, during my lifetime and yours, have had freedom to worship as we see fit here in this country. And uh, it's hard to realize, but a lot of people in the world have not had that. They've been very suppressed in, in expressing uh, their religious views and, and in, uh, attending church and that kind of thing. This is, I know who holds tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from the sunshine, for the skies may turn to gray.
and I know who holds my hand. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know. And thank you, Ray and Jenny, for sharing your gifts with us, leading us, choosing hymns for us to sing. It's a blessing to us each and every Sunday. Again, let us just uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, for your love, we thank you. I said before, for your presence with us, we thank you and praise you. I ask you now, Lord, that you will just bless us as we open your word. Help us to hear what it is you want us to hear today. And for that, Father, we need to open our hearts as well as our ears. We need to be willing to hear your voice. To follow it and be obedient to it. And that is our prayer this morning. We come before you. We humbly bow before you. For you are our Lord. And you are our Savior. You have created us in the likeness of your image. And you are recreating us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus. Grateful we are. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, events unfolded this week, it brought back to me a memory of, uh, I guess, uh, I was about 13 or 14. Often when I tell you stories, I use, the, I use we rather than I, but that's because I have a twin brother, and so often when I tell the story, we were both there, so I just told you to say we. So we were uh, going with my mom to uh, mail something at the post office on a Saturday afternoon. And so we pulled into the post office and parked, and mom went inside, and whatever she had to do, we just sat there. We, we watched, and we saw an ambulance come and pulled down the street right next to the post office. And the only thing down that street was an apartment complex. And uh, uh, our pastor from our church, uh, he lived in that apartment complex. And then I saw a, an Orange City policeman uh, patrol car go down that road. So when mom got back in, we told her, hey, we saw, you know kids, we saw an ambulance, and we saw a cop car, you know, I was like, I wonder what's going on, and this is what I said, I said, I, said, I, I tell you, uh, tomorrow I'm going to ask the preacher, his name is Max Armitage, I said, I'm going to ask the preacher what happened, because, I mean, you know, an ambulance going anywhere, you want to know, kid, you want to know what happened, I mean, you know, emergency was on, and on Adam 12, you know, they were on, they were on TV, we watched those things. And so uh, we did. And later on, though, that uh, evening, my uh, dad got a phone call. And we found out that the ambulance was there for our pastor. And he had uh, decided that he was going to go swimming that day in the pool. Hadn't done it all year. It was in July. We hadn't done it. And uh, I went by himself. Um, and he hit his head some way, somehow. And he drowned. And, uh, you know, that summer, by the way, I'd had a good friend in just a few weeks. I had had a girl that we'd gone to school with since kindergarten. Her dad died. I had a friend from uh, junior high school who was hit by a car and he was killed. And then my pastor died. 
And I remember, I remember going to church that Sunday. Uh, you know, there was only one little parking lot, and you know, most everybody when they entered, they entered at the end of the educational building, and you know, you went to Sunday school that. But what struck me on that Sunday morning as a, a young teenager was the red rimmed eyes. And because some people didn't find out till that morning. And we didn't know. And you know, as a as a, a kid, I was like, you know, what are we going to do? I don't remember anything about that day. I mean, in church and the service or what happened. I don't. But I do know that people mourned and they cried. They they were a part of a family that cared. And Max was a lovable guy. The week before he died, he set up his funeral arrangements. Got them all taken care of. And so it reminded me, the situation with Don this week, uh, of that for uh, our church. What I knew was that our church was different after that. And we called a, a pastor uh, after that who, who helped us to grow and, and it was a wonderful pastor. When I thought about and heard about Don's death, I thought about some scriptures that came to mind. I just want to share a couple with you. One was this. It comes out of 2 Samuel 3.38. And it's David who speaks these words. Uh, and what has happened is that uh, a man named Abner, General Abner, who had been Saul's general, David had been king in Judah for three years, and they'd been fighting. Saul was dead, but they'd been fighting in some ways over who would be king. And Abner had come to David and left. David let him go. He didn't try and kill him or anything. But David's nephews treacherously killed him. And he said this, he said, You must know that a great leader has fallen in Israel today. And I thought about Don. I thought about what he had given in service to this church while I had been your pastor. Knowing that that was not out of character at all, that he'd been giving his service to the Lord and to churches ever since God called him and he responded in faith. I also thought of 1 Thessalonians 4.13 which says, We do not want you to be misinformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest which have no hope. And another verse that I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, is that really in the Bible? Psalms 116.15, which is our verse I want to look at today. Let me read to you from a couple different translations of, of that verse, Psalm 116.15. New King James says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. NIV says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. New Living Translation says, The Lord cares deeply when his loved ones die. New American says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. And the Christian Standard Bible says, The death of his faithful ones is valuable in the Lord's sight. This verse is at once beautiful and startling. It provides a measure of comfort and assurance. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And that's good to hear. But there's also something unsettling at the same time. It says precious is death. The death of one of God's saints. The word precious means valuable or costly. And the ancients would have used the term like we do to describe a precious gem or a fine work of art. Something that was costly. And we understand the costly part because passing of a loved one comes at a heavy price. 
And of course, you know I'm not talking about dollars and cents, but about the toll of tears and grief and heartache. And all of us pay a price in that in terms of long days or sleepless nights and what takes place in the life of a person as they come to the end of their life. That heaviness you feel, it does reflect a sense of loss. And that's okay. It is right and proper to feel that way. I didn't know when I walked into that church so many years ago what I would see. I, I just really had no concept. First person I saw was Lou Tarbutton. She was the secretary at church. And so it worked with our pastor quite a bit, typing things, you know, being there during the day, talking to whatever. <coughs> You know, sometimes folk want to talk like there's something wrong with our faith if we express the pain and loss that we experience. They talk like real faith doesn't shed tears or feel grief. And that's nonsense. The Bible tells us that Jesus wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus. And surely no one can question the depth of Jesus' faith or his understanding of heaven's purposes. He wept and so do we. But we grieve as those who have hope, not as those who have no hope. As Paul said when he was talking about Christ coming in again in his first letter in 1 Thessalonians 4. I read that verse earlier. We do not want you to be misinformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, those who have died. That's what he's saying. So that you will not grieve like the rest. Uh, some translations say like the pagans. Because as Christians, we grieve in a different way. Why? Because we do have hope. We have hope in a Savior and hope in a, in a God who loves us and cares for us. But even so, when we come to Psalm 116, you know, it sits there. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Of course, that raises a big question. How? How, how is this so? What can be precious about death and dying, about the parting of a loved one? Where's the value? Where's the good? And those questions are real. Those are real questions. And you have probably asked those questions, and you have a right to ask them. And there are times when I've asked those same questions. But before I attempt to answer, I must point one important thing out about this verse. This verse is not universal. It does not claim to apply to every death or to every person. It's very clear when it says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The death of his saints. He made it very clear that not everyone should look forward to death. Later on, write this down. I didn't give you a note page. But write this down anyway. John chapter 5. You can start with verse 24, but just write it down. You don't need to go there right now, but... John chapter 5, start with verse 24 and read to the end. If you have a red letter edition, all of it's in red. It's Jesus talking. And he says this, I tell you the truth. And he was talking to religious leaders, those who should have known who he was. And he will talk about the testimony that was John the Baptist's testimony about him. And he talked to them about the testimony that was God's testimony about him. And he talked to him that Moses even testified in the great works and miracles that he was doing where it was a testimony to who he was. And yet they did not believe, would not believe in him. But he said this, I tell you the truth, whoever has my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The psalm speaks only of the death of his saints. As you know, saints aren't angels or perfect people or rare heroes of the church. A saint is one who belongs to God through faith in Christ Jesus. Those are the ones whose death are precious in the sight of God. Now, while we view death as the enemy, God sees it from another view. And how can God view the death of someone as precious? Well, let's look at it a little bit in, from God's point of view if we can. See death from the other side. You know, there's some things that look different from the other side. 
Have you ever looked at the back side of a, of a rug, a woven rug, or even one that's been strips of, of fabrics and, you know, tied off? The front sure doesn't look like the back. We see it from a different side, and when we see it from a different side, we can often see the difference. I, I went on a, a mission trip to Ecuador one, uh, one time, and, and we flew in, got in, stayed at this place, uh, and you know, woke up the next morning, they briefed us a little bit about what we were going to do, got on the buses, uh, and headed up into the Andes. And it was cloudy and it was dreary. And, you know, we just hoped that the buses knew you know, where they were going and would stay on the road. You know, I mean, the roads weren't really wide. We, we just went up. Eventually, though, we got to a place when we were above the clouds. And our surroundings took on a whole new... Uh, well, just what we saw was just so different. Because as we stood there, we took a break, we stood there and we looked out, and all you could see was a sea of white clouds. But sticking out of these white clouds were mountain peaks. They looked like little islands all over the place. Well, some, not even little, big islands. And it gave us a different perspective than what we had as we went up, a different view from the other side. And having us like that, a little girl was staring into the starry night sky with her dad, and she said, Oh, Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what does the right side look like? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. From this side, death is a time of sorrow and of loss, of defeat and separation. From the other side, it's a time of release, of reward, of reunion and rest. It is release. Too many times we think of death as coming to destroy everything for that which we've lived. But instead we should picture death as coming to save those we love. Many people think that death is the end. But we should think of death as the beginning of a more abundant life. An 88-year-old lady sat down with me this week and she asked this question. What do you think happens when you die? I mean, like, what happens right after? They tell her there's a good book Edwin Lutzer wrote, and it's called One Minute After You Die. But I shared with her what the Bible has to say. I said, you'll be with God if you're one of his. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And he actually was saying, you know, which would be better for me in this? See, often when one dies, we think of losing when it should be a thought of gain. We think of parting instead of arrival. Death here on earth is the opening of the gate to eternity. So we'd be much better off if we would view death from the other side, a release into eternity with God. It's also a reward. For many, from this side, death looks like the end. From the other side, it's the beginning. Death seems so final from this side, but it appears to be the end of life, the end of relationships, the end of all that we've worked for, all that we have earned. But from the other side, death is not the end. It's the entrance. It's not a goal. It's a gateway. It's the beginning of a bright new life, eternal for the believer in Christ Jesus, eternal life with Him. See, there are only two options after death, eternal life with God or eternal I say life because I don't want to get the idea that, that um, those who don't go to be with God that it's, it's death and ends it's life but it's life without God without being in his presence being in torment It's the beginning of a bright new life. An anonymous author wrote uh, this. It's called The Ship. It's kind of a view of, of death. He said, I'm standing on the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails in the breeze and starts for the blue ocean. 
I stand and watch her until at the length she's only a ribbon or a, a white cloud, just where the sea and sky comes to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there, she's gone. Gone? Where? Gone from my sight, that's all. She's just as large and mast and hull and spars when she was when she left my sight, and just as able to bear the load of living freight to the place of destination. Her diminished size is in me, not in her, and just at the moment when someone at my side says she's gone, there are other voices ready to take up the glad shout, there she comes. That's time. When we look at death from the other side, we also see it as rest. Charles Spurgeon, the great English Victorian preacher, wrote of the death of Richard Baxter, who was a, a Puritan preacher. As Baxter lay dying, some friends came to him and they asked him, who we all ask at times, how are you doing? He was weak and obviously near death, but with great effort he answered, I am almost well. And then he died. Spurgeon explains, death cures. It is the best medicine for they who die are not only almost well, but healed forever. You will see then that the statement of our text, and he was talking about this text, Psalm, he said the statement of our text implies that the aspect of death is altogether altered from that appearance in which men commonly behold it. Death to the saints is not a penalty, it is not destruction, it's not even a loss. The Bible promises that it's rest. Revelation 14, 11 says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labors. It is also a reunion. From this side, death is a separation, but from the other side, it's a reunion. An elderly man observed this in his life and he expressed it so well. He said, As a boy, I thought of heaven as a city with domes and spires and beautiful streets inhabited by angels. He said, by and by, my little brother died, and I thought of heaven much as before, but with one inhabitant that I knew. Then another died, then some of my acquaintances. So in time, I began to think of heaven as containing several people that I knew. And afterward, another went, and yet another. And by the time I had so many acquaintances and loved ones in heaven that I no more thought of it as a city merely with streets of gold, but as a place full of inhabitants. Now there are so many loved ones there that I sometimes think I know more people in heaven than I do on earth. For the saint, precious in God's sight at death, from, the, from that perspective, from his perspective, this is release, it is reunion, it's a rest and a reward. It fulfills what life was meant to be. But as important as that is, that is not the reality or really what this text is all about. When we take it in the context, of the whole chapter. So we haven't really talked about the most important part of the verse. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saint. This verse speaks from the perspective of heaven. Precious in the sight of the Lord. How so? See, in context, this psalm is really about life, not death. It speaks of the protection the Lord provides us in times of trouble and danger. It is a reminder about how much God values us in life and in death, but especially in life. Psalm 116 begins like this. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ears to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Salvation is what the writer of the psalm is talking about here. See, there's something more. See, our God values us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior by paying the price for our sins on the cross. Regardless of who we are or where we live or what we have or what we've done, he offers us the free gift of forgiveness and life everlasting through faith in Jesus Christ. That is something 
that Don Darden believed, that most of you believe that very thing that are here, at least that I know. Don claimed that promise for his own years ago. Many of you have done that as well. You are children of God. Through all the ups and downs of life, through struggles and battles, we can continue to cling to the hope that is ours because we matter to God. And because we matter to God, we should also live in a way that God matters to us. Precious is the life and death of our friend and servant of God, Don Darden. And so is precious your life in God's sight even now. What we've experienced as a church, it's a hard thing. It's hard. When I woke up Saturday, I expected to see my pastor Sunday in church when I was young. We all miss right now seeing Don and Diana here because they would be here. We mourn because we love and care, and that is as it should be. It is a way that God made us. He made us for relationships. And because we have relationships, when any time a relationship ends, whatever way it ends, there is sorrow and there is grief, and he made us that way. One of the beautiful promises of God is that one day he will wipe away all our tears, which means that until then, it's okay to cry. And our tears should be tinted with a shimmer of hope. Because there stands a bold assurance in life that precious is the death of his saints to the Lord. Keep that to heart in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you do not have the promise of this verse in Psalm. You do not have the promise that you have everlasting life. Life for eternity. It really was pretty easy to come up with a title for this sermon. Precious in death, faithful in life, hope for eternity. That should be, if you will, an epitaph for every child of God. As you deal with what comes in life, remember that you have a God, a Father who cares about you. He cares about you. And if you'd been the only person that needed salvation, our God, the Father, would have still sent His Son to, to be born and to live and to die for you if you had been the only one. That's the picture of the beautiful parable of the lost sheep, of the shepherd who goes and counts his lambs and his sheep, and there are only 99 and there should be 100, and he goes to find the lost sheep to bring it home. And that's what Jesus has done for us. That's what he's done for you. In all that we think and do this week, let us glorify God. Praise him for who he is and what he's done for us. And then, let us go out and let us love those around us. However God stirs your heart to love, love. That wasn't a suggestion. I don't have the authority to command you, but God does. And that's what he tells us to do. To love. And to serve. 
Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what he wants us to do. Let's pray. Father, how good it is for us to see in the Bible, your word, the authority that it has over us because we believe and then we yield to that authority. And we see in your word how much you care and what you've done. And so let us rest in that care. Wherever we might be in our journey of life, wherever we might be in our travels, wherever we might be, let us rest in you. Knowing that there will come a time when we will rest in you for eternity. But until then, you tell us to come to you bring our burdens to you. To take your yoke upon us for your burdens are light. To receive you as our Lord and Savior. To live for you as our Lord and Savior. And I pray that whatever you spoke to us this morning, our hearts have been opened to hear. And then you will make our hearts respond joyfully to what it is you call us to do. Thank you for this family of faith. More importantly, thank you for Jesus.